In this following video, I'd like to discuss a very interesting case of pseudophagic capsular contraction in a patient who underwent uneventful phagoemulsification. This 50-year-old patient presented us with the following findings. She was a high myope of minus 18 diopters. Her best corrected vision improved to only finger counting at 40 centimeters in the right eye and counting fingers at 3 meters in the left eye. On clinical examination, we found a dense nucleosclerosis slightly more in the right eye as opposed to the left. The retinal examination revealed a myopic fundus in both eyes. The left eye had a geographic atrophy of the fovea and both eyes had a normal retinal periphery with no treatable lesions. So we planned a cataract surgery for this patient and we planned to operate on the right eye first. A guarded visual prognosis was taken because clearly despite the correction of minus 18 diopters, her vision really didn't seem to improve significantly in either eye. The patient underwent an uneventful phagoemulsification procedure for the right eye. In the immediate post-operative period, the patient was extremely happy. Evaluation of the vision revealed the following. Her vision was 6 by 9 part unaided, with the correction of a minus half spherical with a minus half cylinder at 50 degrees, she improved further to 6 by 8. With a plus 2.5 add, her near vision improved to n by 6. As you can see, a month later when she came for a final refraction, her refraction hadn't changed very much. Now here's where it gets really interesting. Seven weeks after surgery, the patient presented with some amount of visual deterioration in the right eye of a few days duration. Her vision in the right eye had dropped to 6 by 60. With pinhole, it improved just to 618. To our surprise, her refractive error had completely changed. She was now accepting a sphere of plus 3.5 diopters and a cylinder of minus 4 at 80 degrees. Now with this refractive correction, however, she improved to 6 by 9. We then performed a dilated eye examination. And this is what we found. I'd like you to notice the intense fibrosis of the anterior capsule. This excessive fibrosis seemed to have caused a narrowing of the opening in the anterior capsule. You will also notice that there seems to be a gap between the anterior capsular rim as well as the anterior surface of the optic. Perhaps this is seen more clearly here. On further dilatation of the pupil, here's what we found. You can see the capsular contraction has resulted in the optic bending in such a manner that it's bowing backwards. The superior and the inferior edge of the optic are clearly visible as they've moved more centrally as a result of the backward bowing of the optic. In order to further understand what were the visual effects of this phenomena, we performed a ray tracing abrometry. And here's what we found. The Chang analysis did not reveal any significant internal aberrations. The DLI, on the other hand, had dropped to 3.82, when anything less than 5 is considered abnormal. We also looked at the drop in the MTF, that is the contrast, and there was a significant drop in the internal contrast as a result of the pseudophagic capsular contraction and its effect on the eye well position. Clearly, for all the aforementioned reasons, something needed to be done. The question now was, were we going to cut this anterior capsule using a YAG laser or was it going to be a surgical capsulotomy? After taking time and explaining clearly to the patient what exactly had happened and what the plan was, we decided to take the patient up for surgery. Let's now move to watching the surgery. At the outset, we make two paracentesis incisions using a 20 gauge MVR. An intracameral midriatic is then injected into the anterior chamber with the view of dilating the pupil. Under viscoelastic cover, with the help 
of an interocular scissors. Watch how I make three nicks in the anterior capsule 120 degrees apart. This is what you'll see in this part of the video. Having made the first cut, I then introduced some viscoelastic to create a viscomidriasis to get a clear view of the capsulotomy thus created. I then proceed to making the second cut in the anterior capsule inferiorly. A coglin hook is used to retract the nasal anterior capsule to aid visibility for making the third cut. Upon the completion of the capsulotomy, the excessive viscoelastic is washed out from the anterior chamber and the wound hydrated. Let's see how the patient did in the post-operative period. When we examined her about three hours after the surgery, she was extremely happy. She had regained her vision once again. Following the dilatation of the pupil, slit lamp examination revealed the following. You can see now the capsulotomy cuts in the anterior capsule and you can see that as a result of this opened out anterior capsule, the IOL now is no longer bowing backwards and there doesn't seem to be a gap anymore between the anterior capsule and the anterior surface of the IOL. We performed a ray tracing abrometry and this is what we found. The Chang analysis did not show significant internal aberrations, but you can notice the DLI has now gone up to 8.7. There's also a significant improvement in the internal contrast, meaning the overall quality of vision is now significantly better. One week following the capsulotomy, she had an unaided vision of 6 by 12. And with a plus half spherical, with a minus 1.5 cylinder at 70 degrees, her vision was 6 by 6. With a plus 2.5 ad, she had a near vision of n by 6. So what exactly is the pseudophagic contraction of the anterior capsule? Pseudophagic capsular contraction is often associated with weakened zonules. Capsular contraction is the result of an imbalance between the centrifugal forces of the zonules and haptics and the centripetal forces of the proliferative and the metaplastic residual epithelial cells. This condition typically presents a few months or years after surgery and can result in various complications such as IOL decentration, tilt, subluxation as well as dislocation. And therefore, an early diagnosis is very important to prevent these complications. And therefore, in cases prone to developing a pseudophagic capsular contraction, like our patient who is highly myopic, we could consider 1. the use of a CTR in this patient, 2. to ensure that the rexus was not too tiny, and finally, a thorough cortical cleanup, avoiding any residual epithelial cells, would make all the difference in a case like this. With this, I come to the end of this presentation. Thank you.